We're going to have a... Hi, this is Adam Elio Berkowitz from Israel 365 News, coming at you from the Golan, where all the fun is. Today, I'm going to have a very dear friend, a very special man named Daron Kedar. Uh, Daron has a very special personal story, and more importantly, he's going to be telling us uh, about the location of the first and second temples and where the third temple is going to be. There's a lot of controversy about that. There's a lot of fake news, and we're here to tell the truth about where the the first and second temp, second temples really were. Um, so my friend Daron Kedar, uh, Daron, are we are we hearing talking to you? Is everything technically okay? As far as I can tell, I can hear you, and if you can hear me, we're good to go. Thank God, we kind of we're doing this <laughs> one on the fly. That's um, right. So so Daron, um, tell me a little bit about yourself, especially uh, your connection with Israel and and how you came to Israel. Well, I was actually born and raised in Israel. I'm uh, a Tzabar, as we say in Israel, or a Sabra, you guys call it, the Americans. And my parents were actually um, not from the Jewish people. My dad was a Christian Zionist who fought in World War II and had a real passion and a zeal for the people of Israel, to support Israel. He actually even lied about his age in order to fight in the war effort to defend the Jewish people. And so that was something that carried over in his professional life after the war was over. He told and you that that was he told you that that was his intention when he went to fight in World War II? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. That That's was astounding. you know, he was 15 That's years astounding. old and lied about his age so he could get into the into the navy. <laughs> Most people lie to get cigarettes or something like that yeah. at that age. I, I know, right? <laughs> That's pretty astounding. Yeah, and I think Again, we we ended up split up, and I ended up in foster care. So I don't, I didn't get to hear too much, but everything's kind of pieced together from speaking to other family members throughout the years. And what I understand, and something I remember as a young child, my father was very, very defensive of the Jewish people. You know, he would constantly raise me up with this mindset of you know, we stand up for the Jewish people. We're here to defend them, to fight for them. And that's something that's been ingrained in me. Uh, and, and I think it's part of what made me into this warrior guy where, you know, my focus has been security, defense, and, and all that, because there's there's something in being a protector, defender, that's kind of part of my DNA, even from, from my childhood, that was passed on through my father. Um, I mean, for example, on uh, when my father was a young boy, okay, a really young boy, and his father used to spar with the heavyweights in Washington, D.C. That's where he grew up. And so my father wanted to impress his dad, you know, my grandfather. And so he came home all, all roughed up one day, and his father said, hey, what happened? Did you get in a fight? And he goes, yeah. He says, but don't worry, you know, I won. He goes, that's great. That's wonderful. But who'd you fight? You know, and he goes, oh, it's nothing to worry about. And he says, well, who was it? He goes, oh, it's the rabbi's kid down the street. And, and his father just stopped him in his tracks and goes, don't you ever raise your finger against God's chosen people. Do you understand? And it was like, you know, oh, my goodness. Like here, you know, he in his mind, he thought he impressed his dad because he did what his dad probably had taught him some moves or something. Who knows? And and here his dad was not impressed because it was the wrong guy. And so that's something I remember my father telling me once when I was younger and um and then later on, I just, you know, the Holocaust, you know, when we would have Holocaust Memorial, my father would have those like a huge poster size, like board where he would flip the pictures and and he would sit us down and he'd say, all right, today's Holocaust Memorial. And, and he would show us what you would see in, in, in the Holocaust Museum, those pictures. We would see, you know, my father personally walking us through the Holocaust and saying, this is what bad people did to God's chosen people. And uh, we need to do something about that to make sure that never happens again. Was he was he a devout man? He was. Your yeah, I, I, he was. He was devout uh, Christian, and he was also very much into um, into Judaism. And he even wrote a book about his 
um, research as a Christian, researching the Jewish history, I guess, or background to the, the Christian faith that he was very much connected to or, or, or drawn to in his research. So you grew up in Israel as a Christian. Yeah, yeah. In a Moroccan. And, and served in the IDF as a Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in a combat unit. In a combat unit, yes. Wow. During the, the Gaza days when we were still in Gaza. And uh, you converted at one point, am I correct? Yes, it was during my military career. Yeah, yeah. Ah. I got, uh, I got, um, they sent me a request to say, hey, if you want to go to this course, uh, it's a it's a it's a conversion course, but really it's the first phase is learning learning about Israel, learning about the you know it was more like you know the the development of the nation, touring different parts of the country and and getting to know the land. Which I was like, look, I already know this country. I grew right. up. Right, you were born yeah. here, yeah. But, um, but a lot of those, the people in the course, they're 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 Jewish either because of their dad, and they're serving the military, and for them. You know, they're coming also from abroad, a lot of them. So for them, it was to connect them really to the course. So it was all inclusive in the sense of trying to meet most of the people that are coming to the course. And, so you, and em you, you, you embody a very unique and strong connection between the Jewish, I don't even want to say the Jewish people, um, the, the Jewish people of today yeah. um, and, and the Christian people. Yeah, yeah, like a bridge. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to point out yesterday. <laughs> yesterday we were we we, we were so happy. we merited speaking to your brother-in-law John Enerson, mm -hmm. uh, and he, he I John I I I think he's fantastic. He he I think you and him together um, running cry for Zion. Cry for Zion is on one hand fighting for Jewish rights on the Temple Mount, but on the other hand. Two years ago, you ran this amazing, uh, it was really, for me, it was transformational um, yeah. conference about connecting Christians to the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. And you're not trying to convert Christians. You're not no. trying to, to <laughs> you, I think if anything, you're trying to, um, you're trying to expose them to a new aspect of their belief yeah. that actually was already there. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's, it's education. Exactly. It's education. My, my personal goal, first of all, when it comes to faith, it's, I don't want to convert anybody to my worldview per se, because oh. to me, faith is a personal thing. Right. But I would say, because like we talked a little bit about my background, I recognize the gaps within uh, the Christian worldview and the understanding of scripture that, was written by, and I'm assuming John probably even touch, uh, talked about this, uh, is written by Jews, right? A lot of the New Testament, these are Jewish people, Jewish characters, and they're talking from a Jewish perspective. And as a Christian who speaks French or Chinese or American English or British, etc., you're reading translations of that viewpoint that comes from a Jewish viewpoint in Jerusalem, right? At, in Second Temple period. So you have a lot of loss in translation because unlike Judaism, where you study the Torah and you go to the Bet Knesset, you read the Torah in Hebrew. You don't read it in your translations, right? Um, although there are translations, but that's for convenience sake that you do on your own. You're not going to do Aliyah la Torah as far as I know. I've, I haven't seen it. Aliyah la Torah in the native language of the foreign country you're in. You I've, I've actually seen that. It's a little bit. You have. Yeah, it's 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 unusual, but it's, but it's not orthodoxy, right? No. Okay. And actually, I remember and the same with Islam, right? I mean, the same with Islam, right. you know. But that so Christians have this is their weak point is that they don't know their own scripture mm -hmm. because they read a translation of it, and so what we're doing really is just reverse engineering, so to speak, of what they have written, mis uh, translated, and putting it into the right context. That's really what we're trying to do. And then what that does, when you read a lot of the different passages that are in the New Testament with the right context and specifically talk about the temple, the temple is very important. It's very emphasis, it's emphasized very strongly in the New Testament and very strongly for, for Jesus and for his disciples. And so for what? Christians not to be interested in the temple is a sad reality of today 
because of those years of disconnection and loss in translation. Just well, to clarify, uh, the, the Christian scripture was not written in Hebrew. Um, it was written in, in, uh, in well, it could have been Aramaic, it could have been Greek, Latin. I mean, th these, these translations, yeah. these mis translations could be also mistranslated into the Hebrew because these, the original, unlike the, the Hebrew scripture, which was written originally that is different. in Hebrew. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But n not exclusively. So, for example, the Gospels, some of them could have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. But most of like Paul's writings, for example, would have been in the Greek world's language that he's speaking to, because he's actually speaking to non-Jews and communicating actually Jewish concepts to non-Jews. So then it's trying to understand what is this guy trying to say in 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 a in in, in trying to borrow words from from the from the Roman world to communicate a Hebrew message. And so you have that as well. So yeah, but that's true. I mean, it, it is different that as well, but more or less the main, the main foundation is the same is that, that it's Jewish ideas and that really the foundation for all those ideas is, is the Torah, is the prophets, is the writings. And so that of course, you know, they're, they're, they're preserved in their, in their, in, in the absolute Jewish context, of course. It's, it's Let's funny that, temple. it's funny huh? that of all these. Let's talk of, temple. I yeah. It's yeah. Funny yeah. That of all these <laughs> Christian ideas that did make it over into the yeah. New Testament and are still very strong in Christianity, the temple seems like, oh no, we can't go there. Even though yeah. that's essential in the, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, in the Torah, yes. in the, and and yet it got lost in Christianity. Um, I remember that's one why. Of, what I just said there actually. That's right, the why. right. Part of, the, part of the why. Part of the why. got lost in translation. Part of it. Um, yeah. but, mm -hmm. A little more than that. But yeah. one of the things that one of the things that astounded me about your the conference you ran. It's mm -hmm. really. I mean, I'm still I'm still revving on the conference now. The, uh, two years later, <laughs> Josh was even there. Yeah. Um, was that even uh, you based the you based the conference from what I thought was an absurd point. You said you wanted to dispel the myth that the temples stood on the Temple Mount. And as a Jew, I'm like, well, where else would they be? Pittsburgh? Right. You know? Yeah, it yeah. Totally hey, hey, absurd hey. To don't, me. don't start with Pittsburgh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Josh is from Pittsburgh. He's got to stand okay. up for it. But they didn't have the temple there, Josh. No. <laughs> there, there, are, there are temples. Okay. It, reminds me, it reminds me of when, when the Indian premier came to Israel and he was taken around by the prime minister of Israel to, to the old city. And he kept talking about the, the, the Kotel, the Western Wall, and the temple that was the second temple that was stood behind it. And he's talking about the temple, the temple, the temple. And finally, the, the Indian premier says, I don't know why you keep talking about this temple. We have thousands of temples. What, what's with this temple that you keep talking right. about? <laughs> so, so I thought see, I that's thought a perfect point, by the way. See, people understand certain topics from their worldview. And again, Judaism has preserved the, the these topics, right, within the family of Israel. Whereas the Christian world, depending on where they're coming from in the world, they're going to view a topic like the temple, like, oh, pff, what? We have many temples. Like, what's the big deal? We don't understand, right? Or other things. There's, there's always going to be the loss in translation because the Christians are very diverse. I mean, that's something important to understand. They're very diverse very different cultures and uh you have to speak within to to tra to speak into their mindset and their worldview and to to communicate some of what's you know normal for us or you know like move on may love it's not to them you know i was surprised when i when i when you before i went to the conference i spoke to anarina hayman she yeah. was uh, a representative of the city of david right and the city of david is close it's um it's downhill from the temple, I guess like a five minute walk, not so far away at all, but yeah. it's a different site. It's on the hillside. Yeah. It's an archeological site. And um, she told me that she was asked hundreds of times a day, hundreds, <laughs> where's the where's the remains of the temple? And I'm like, you're, you're a tourist, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, and I was yeah. like, what are you talking me right there? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's just I couldn't understand how anyone could believe that. And sure. then at your conference, I actually had a reporter from an reporter for archaeology. You remember that guy from National <laughs> Geographic? 
And I purposely start... never mentioned him, but I, I was being nice to National Geographic. Oh my god! Okay, I couldn't believe they sent that guy like that. And he, no, very nice. to be honest, but since but you he, mentioned him, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the bad guy. Me, he said to me this <laughs> line that I've since heard many, many times, which is, yeah. "There's never been any real archaeology on the Temple Mount," no. meaning there's no proof, which was an astounding yeah. thing for me to hear. Yeah, and you might make a, a really stretched case to say he's technically correct. Yeah. But no archaeological um, excavations, not not archaeology. There's no right. Archaeology. I mean, where where they go up and they make sure. the dig, where the grid make the grid and everything. Sure. No, there hasn't been that, and there are very clear and obvious reasons why. And it's not Correct. because it's not because Israel will not let it. So Correct. let's jump into it. Where were the Jewish temples? Yeah. So the Jewish temples. Um, I mean, really, I'm not the guy to ask because I'm not an expert on, on uh, archaeology, and I'll be the first to say that. I think that's important to point out that neither myself nor John uh, within Cry for Zion are experts, but we have spoken to some of the most well-known experts in the world when it comes to the Temple Mount and, and archaeology. Um, I've met personally and had a personal tour with um, Mr. Uh, Dan Bahat, okay, um, I'm assuming he he knows his stuff. Um, I'll venture to say that. Um, some people might dispute that or want to dispute that because they have some other guy that they might think is a better, you know, scholar or what have you. But uh, Dan Bahat has been a leading professor in the study of Jerusalem, written books on it that are that are peer reviewed. Okay. Um, I mean, the guys, I mean, he's an expert. And let me tell you, the, the few hours I spent with him, my my mind is still trying to process the information because it's like the guy's a walking computer. And that's where you know these people, they live it. You know, they don't just, they, it's not just a hobby to them. Like a lot of the people that we run into online, um, it seems like it's a hobby to them, right? Um, and so- He's not, he's not- He's not the picture I saw of him. He's not wearing a, a cape on his head. He's, he's not, not a religious, religious gentleman. No, so he doesn't have a religious right. agenda. No, exactly. That's the other thing. If <laughs> and that's the thing that's funny to me, right? If if somebody, because that's the thing is, people always say, "Well, there's an agenda. Everybody has an agenda." And I I understand that somewhat. I like to think I don't have an agenda because I really am in search for truth. Um, that's my personal beef, or, you know, in this, you know, there's not, I don't lose anything if the temple's in the city of David. It doesn't, I don't lose sleep about it. It's not going to reorient my life. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to shake me, honestly. If if we found archaeological proof today, right now as we speak, um, I will gladly go with the evidence because to me, the evidence is what you go by. It's not that I have a religious um uh, hang up that I'm hanging on to like, no, 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 this is where Israel says it is. I'm going with all the, the people of Israel. And, 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 you know, if this, if this Titanic's going down, we're going to go down together. On the one hand, I would say I am like that as far as ideally speaking, but as far as the research that we put out and the, and what we look for as far as research wise, I don't, I don't, I'm not afraid to overturn every stone because I'm afraid to be disproved of, 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 of that. Because at the same time, my viewpoint is I'm going with Israel wherever Israel's going uh, uh, as, as far as the collective whole and, and I'm with, with Am Yisrael and, and you know, Baesho Bamaim, so to speak. But when it comes to the research and to looking into the evidence of what we know of the city of David versus uh, the Temple Mount, um, the evidence is screaming, and I mean screaming, um, that the Temple Mount really is the Temple Mount um, and that the city of David really is where Jerusalem started. We know that because we – and by the way, I've just taken the – they are not course. synonymous. The, the, the city of no. David is the city of David. The Temple Mount is the Temple Mount. Um, they're not synonymous, but this is where things get messed up in lost in the, the loss in translation because you'll hear people talk about Zion, and we know that Zion is the Temple Mount. And because Zion, the 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 stronghold of Zion, as it's quoted in, in the English, the stronghold of Zion, and this is what you'll hear Christians talk about, and 
and this is the case that they'll fight is because it says the stronghold of Zion and that Jerusalem is Zion. They're one and the same. They're not, you know, separated. Now we know archaeologically and geographically they're, 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 they're on the same mountain slope and it's like this. Okay. Whoop, here we go. Here's the mountain slope, right? It, 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 it starts. There you go. That's good. And it, 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 it like Mount Zion's at the top, right? And it goes down into the thumb, which is, which is a uh, um, city of David. It's like a long thumb, right? G to understand the simplicity of what the mountain's like. So it's the same mountain. And Mount and 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 City of David is is part of this slope that comes out of Mount Zion slash M Mount Moriah, right? Um, so it's the same mountain. It's just that here in the middle, they're kind of cut off by a like a dip in the mountain, right? So you have a physical separation from the two locations, and it in the City of David or the Jebusite city started in the mountain slope that comes off the of mount. Zion, it starts there. David conquers it and then later moves up the mountain to build Solomon's temple years later. Can we later. take a look at the map? Can you can you just describe that yeah. on the map? That we so have? so let's look at this map. Okay, so this is a map that I've put up as far as discussing what the theory is that's out there that says that the that that the temple has to be in the city of David because of Okay, this is according to uh, Robert Cornuck, which is not exclusively his theory. Um, he's actually piggybacking off of a, a, a theory that came before him by uh, Ernest Martin. So he's just following Ernest Martin's opinion. And, and I'm assuming he's also adding some of his own uh, research that he's done. And you'll notice that in this picture you have in the green to, is it is it to the right of the screen of the audience as well? Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's to the right. I'm okay. assuming. Patient's the same. So to the right of the, your screen or the green box, that's the 500 uh, square cubits, right? That that we talk that, that's mentioned by the way in Jewish writings and the Mishnah and so on and so forth, right? Um this is what w this is where a lot of the Christian world kind of falls off because they don't read Jewish uh, 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 writing so much, and when they do, they get lost because they don't understand that 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 basically, why would you discuss only the 500 cubits and not the extensions, right? Well, how come they're not talking about the Hasmonean extension? How come they're not talking about Herod's extension of the Temple Mount Plaza? Which, if you pay attention to the figure, uh, uh, the green figure on the right, surrounded by it is a huge courtyard with with an expanded uh, courtyard. And so I just mentioned the three or the two additions that were added to the 500 original 500 square cubits, right? So that's what we have. Now to your left, the proposed, if you move over the 500 square cubits, the proposed location of Cornuk's temple is, is, is in the city of David, which you can clearly see if you were to move the 500 square cubits alone, not the expansions of the Hasmoneans and not the expansion of Herod, you end up with a kind of a big, big problem. The um, the temple and and you notice the Gihon Spring there is is also uh, 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 pointed out because they're they're really big about the water source. Okay, so here we have it right on the water source, plenty of water to serve the temple, like the people like to argue. But here's the thing: archaeologically speaking, we found nothing to to support this 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 opinion. Um, and I was just mentioning earlier that I'm taking the uh, tour guide course this year. And let me tell you, in the tour guide course, this isn't amateur stuff. We meet with the top experts in archaeology, in ge geography, in every aspect when it comes to the land of Israel. And we've actually covered the city of David. And I asked them about the theory, by the way. Um, I made a little bit of a fool of myself because the guy looked at me like, what kind of stupid question is that? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, some people ask it. So, you know, you know, and he, he just was like, uh, no, it, it, it couldn't be. We haven't found anything to, to support that. So no. Right. Even if there's, hasn't been any archeology span <laughs> in situ um, on the Temple Mount, yeah. there has been loads of archeology span in the city of David. And if there yeah. had been a temple there, they would have found something and but, they haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this, this map that you put up yes. is not the mainstream um, 
Jewish Orthodox view of, uh, meaning it's more or less correct, but that green right. is a little bit north, meaning usually they place the Dome of the Rock in the center of that box and not, yes. there's an opinion like 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 this, but this is a minority opinion when it comes to where the 500 cubits are. Yeah, Joshua, that's a perfect point that you just raised because I think what people need to understand is, is within the Jewish world, first of all, yes, there is a dispute and you just mentioned that. Yes, there is a dispute. Uh, not to the location of the Temple Mount, but to the minutia of how do you orient the 500 square cubits within the plaza, correct? Correct. Nobody nobody that I know of has said this 500 square cubits needs to be dramatically moved over, although I've seen one opinion that does, and we discussed this actually uh, when we covered the City of David, that throws it over like in between that gorge area there. There right. was a mistaken opinion. Like one opinion. There was a mistaken opinion. Opinions um, going <laughs> yeah. back over over a century ago from yeah. rabbis that lived in Europe and did not merit to see and and know what we know today. Um, mm -hmm. That believed that the the western wall was actually a wall of the temple, and that would have made the the kotel, the western wall plaza that we have today, part of the temple of the five hundred cubits that you're mentioning. Um, yeah. It is almost completely rejected. There are very few people that actually abide by this. And, and those people that do, they would have to go and, and purify themselves in a ritual bath and take off their shoes before they went to the, the, the Kotel Plaza. It's almost not done. I mean, it, today it's understood that that is a retaining wall of Herod and that is not a wall of the temple. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to so ask. We're looking at 90% of... agreement that it's up on the Temple Mount, right? I mean, I can fairly say that based on what not, I've researched. Not 90%, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so I have a I have a kind of unpleasant question. <laughs> yeah, okay? sure. Uh, this is the question. So, if it's for for Jews from a from a from an aspect of belief and clear strong tradition, yeah. um, that that because that's a, the other argument. It's tradition that right, we're coming a, against here. Thousand yeah. percent up there, and if archaeologically yeah. it's a, mm. it's a thousand percent up there. No, no archaeologists would stand up in public and say, no, it's not up there. So here comes the question. Why won't Christians believe us? It's a very good question, uh, Adam. It's a very good question. Um, it's not that they won't believe us. I I'll tell you the problem. It the problem is simple. You and I live in Israel, in Eretz Israel. We don't appear on cr Christian television. It's that simple. We don't really? yes, because we don't have access to the viewership that Robert Cornick does and all the people who are spinning this theory have, they have a monopoly on the information that reaches the Christian audience. But they're so lying. The, um, but they're lying. Wait, no, no, wait, wait. I know they're lying. No, they're not lying. I won't say they're lying. It's not it's not mm -hmm. true to say that they're I'll lying. I think I think I think they're they're I think I'll be nice and just say, look. I'm assuming they've done their research. And, and I also, I've, I've run into many Christians throughout my years where I've seen this uh, repeatedly. They love to, they love to be the guy who's the Indiana Jones, you know, like we say in Hebrew, Chaim Beseret. Americans and Joshua can also attest to this. I've noticed as an Israeli, Americans seem to have this thing where they, Chaim Beseret, you know, like. They, they like they the really, drama. They like the yeah. drama. And Israelis are not like that. We're not into that stuff. We're, we're really not drama. We like we like get to the point. Yeah, we, we live drama. We don't need to make it up. Right. We, <laughs> Thank you. And we so, got you know what I mean? flying at us. We don't need drama. <laughs> exactly. You know, our, our lives are are exactly our lives are dramatic enough. We don't have to make up stuff. And I can understand that because I've lived in the U.S. for a few times, a few periods. And you see the way of life of, of Americans, and I can understand why the entertainment industry is so big there, because people have, they're bored to death in many parts of the US. They're bored to death. You have miles and miles of nothing. And so you have to make amusement parks and, and theaters and movies and talk about stuff as if, you know, the whole world wants to conquer America and destroy America. And, you know, the terrorists are always, in, always trying to conquer uh, LA and New York but never, you know, Kansas or something. Kinda, and so that's where all the drama likes to kind of, if you notice, gravitate. And, 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 and yet here in Israel, we're like, we are the ones that the whole world wants to kill and we have all these enemies and whatever. And we don't, we don't make a drama about it. We don't make movies about per se. And when we do, they're, 
we're not on that level. And so I'm just saying I've noticed there's this tendency to be really influenced by ideas that just it's like no no that's just no <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work honest, that's not the answer i was expecting but i kind of i remember when i watched yeah. uh, indiana jones and they brought out yeah. the 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 temple the 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 the, the arona brit the 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 ark of the covenant and i was like yeah. Woo! and then um all the nazis <laughs> started dying and i'm like yeah 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 <laughs> right 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 they start melting to death and and okay. yeah, maybe I've also heard people say that it's nice because then if 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 the temple was if the third temple was in the in the um, city of David, then there wouldn't be a conflict with the Muslims, which shows that they don't understand the Muslims. Because if we start building the third temple in this in the city of David, well, they'll claim that that's the fourth holiest Muslim site, so <laughs> it's not going to help. Yeah. Um, yeah, are from uh, from YouTube yeah, has that. a question for us. Was Harabayat really Antonio Fortress used by the Tenth Roman Legion? Yeah. First of all, it's a great question, and and again, you know, I'm not afraid of questions. I'm not afraid of of of, of looking into these uh, issues. Um. Okay. So I've spoken, like I said, to some of the top experts. I'll also throw out Joseph Good. Um, we had the privilege on our last trip to the U.S. in 2019 after the convention to go to his home. And let me tell you, this guy has every book on the planet. Um, he's, brilliant. he's brilliant. He's, he's not, not just he's Jewish. brilliant. I can see why. He has mm -hmm. every Jewish book on the subject, every Christian book on the subject, and every other book on the subject. Literally. I mean, no joke. I've seen his he, library. He's it's cool amazing. Me. He's not Jewish, and he knows the oral law. Yeah. better than I do. And I was just like, and you can say that, but yeah, I, I spent 10 years there too, because I don't, I'm not very uh, well versed. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm learning. So here's the deal based on talking. And, and really I, I asked them the hard questions. We don't just sit around and pat each other's back and go, no, 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 you're awesome, man. You're amazing. You know, I agree with you. I'm not that kind of person. I like to challenge and you can ask John today. We did this today. We sat down we talked uh, as we planned out the day, and I said, "I said, uh, I'm reading my my the comments of people viewing our content, and I'm looking at some of the responses, and we're missing our audience apparently, because we're obviously not answering their questions, which I thought we were. So I said, here's my challenge for this year: we need to start, you know, digging deep and getting some real, real, you know, real engagement here and speaking their language, because apparently we're not." So um, anyhow, so to the question, was the 10th Roman Legion? It's a good question. The answer is yes and no. It was up on the Temple Mount based on the research that we have and the evidence that we have archaeologically speaking. Um, the problem is, and there's also other suggestions, by the way, that the 10th Roman Legion um, were housed throughout what we call the old city today. And that, in fact, they've they've some of the most recent finds as of the last year, literally towards the end of last year, I believe it was, they found another um, archaeological site with the Tenth Roman Legion um, tiles, the roof tiles with the stamp of the Tenth Roman Legion. So they've been they most likely were spread out throughout the city. First of all, as far as housing is concerned. On the very northern part of the Temple Mount, you had adequately built a, 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 a fortress that was built by King Herod, okay, not by the Romans, to accommodate the Romans and, and also to justify the building of this massive structure that Herod was building for the temple because he was playing the game of politics for both pleasing the Jewish people and the Romans, right? And so being in the middle... And on the one hand, really wanting to make a name for himself and build the temple of all temples that were ever built, which when, when that temple was built, everybody were like, wow, this is amazing. At the same time, he definitely built an adequate Roman fort for the 10th Legion to supervise and secure the Temple Mount against riots and so on and so forth. And, and, and you have the evidence of it. The problem is, and this is where Cornuck and all these guys go off like way off the, 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 the research they're way off because it just, it's not there. I haven't found it any in any of their books. And by the way, I don't talk 
nonsense. I've read the guy's book. Okay. I have notes all throughout his book where I've critiqued and seen a lot of discrepancy and, and you like, you're just overlooking swaths of information. Like, I'm sorry, that's just not true. Or you're saying you're writing things in a way that, that, that you're misleading your audience. So being that we're privileged to live here and I speak the language, I grew up here. I Hebrew is my first language, not English, although I sound like an American. And, and so I have the privilege to be able to siphon through the information in the Hebrew and with the local guys and look at the evidence daily, not fly by night, do an ex expedition as they call it, and go back to Colorado and play golf. Sorry, that's not what I do. I spent years of my life researching this, looking at the evidence, and they don't mention that the, that the fort was destroyed. It was raised to the ground according to the Jewish wars of Josephus. He records it and he records it beautifully. Like, you know, anybody who understands military and, and tactical movement, you, you can play it out in your mind beautifully. He really paints a perfect picture. And what happens is they destroy the fort, raise it to the ground so they can access the Temple Mount. And according to Cornick's misreading of the information, if you look at the diagram that, that we made there, that we put up, that's what the 300 uh, uh, the was it the 300 feet bridge that he misinterprets for the portico that that needs to move up north up onto the Temple Mount because there's a portico there and by the way that portico continues it doesn't stop um, so anyhow it's just part of the connecting piece there that connected and allowed access to the Temple Mount and here's a here's a quick question for the people who think that I'm out there. Because I know, you know, your guys' Christian audience, they really think what we're discussing right now, like we're just trying to hide and put, you know, defend our Jewish traditions and all this stuff. It couldn't be farther from the truth. I know Mr. Cornuck says this and makes that claim. He doesn't understand Jewish tradition, first of all. I'll, I'll say that. Not in the same extent as I can say I do. And he doesn't understand that in Judaism, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, because you both studied rabbinics, right? There's nothing wrong with asking questions. You question everything. Is that right? That's, I mean, am I wrong to say that? That's the way we learn. There is, is that something you learn? wrong with not asking questions. Right. Thank you. The See, opposite. in Christianity, it's the opposite. You don't question oh. theology. You don't question the creeds. You don't question the, the trinity. You don't, qu you don't question anything. You just take it as this is what we believe. And if you don't believe this, you're going to hell. Because this is how the church uh, in the early stages, okay, when it was, and I'm mainly referring to the Roman Catholic Church, when it, when it, when it institutionalized itself and in order to gain uh, ground, it was through fear and an intimidation. And unfortunately, that still plagues the Christian world. I'm not saying that they're fearful, especially not evangelicals or, or, or Protestants. You know, they broke away from that, but they still have that part of their heritage that they don't recognize that actually you're the one who's afraid of your traditions. That's the irony. I don't think Judy, again, my interaction with Judaism, it's the opposite. Judaism's not afraid to ask questions. And that's what shocked me. I thought, wow, because when you ask Christians, their misconceived idea and what they're told is actually it's Jews who are afraid to ask questions. They're they're all about their tradition and they won't let go of it. So uh, we have, have a, a point here oh. from Facebook from Vicky Petros that says we do we do question. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Please do not go there. Do I'm not sure we if you do want to question. Understand. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Please do not go there. Okay. Um, okay. I think I understand where you're, where, where you're talking about, uh, Vicky, because I've seen some of your comments in the past and trying to defend um, some attacks against you on my page, I, I actually recall. So, no, that's not where I'm going at. What I'm saying is, and you need to understand this, what I'm doing, I'm not trying to attack Christianity, first of all. Um, what I'm doing is I'm literally giving you the historic understanding of of, of, of pointing out what happened historically, how things developed, why you as a Christian believe what you believe today, why Jews believe what they believe today. Because you know what? Judaism, and I'll throw this out here too, you know, I'm not just going to throw mud at the, at the Christian world. I'll throw mud right back and say, you know what? Judaism 
misunderstands Christianity miserably as well. Oh my gosh, yes. Oh as my well. gosh. Horrible. You know why? Uh, Adam, do you have a New Testament in your home? <laughs> right here. <laughs> okay. Josh, have you? No, sir. Okay, thank you. I have, so, I have tried to read it many times and have never managed. Exactly. Okay. Now, most Orthodox Jews, halakhically, are not, they're forbidden from having a New Testament. Am I mistaken Probably on that? Probably true. Probably right. true. <laughs> okay. Now, what does that do? That creates ignorance for you as a Jew when trying to interpret what a Christian is saying, right? Because Dude, you never I read what they, America, you never and, read what they know. I know nothing about Christianity. It's embarrassing. Yes. And it's the same with Christians. They don't know anything about Judaism because to understand Judaism, you can't Google it. You can't Google it. Right. You have right. to go to a Bet Midrash. You have to study under a rabbi or someone learned who understands halacha, and they need to explain and discuss and go into all the intricacies. And what do we mean by this? What do we mean? By... It's not that simple. It's not something you just pull I off think, the shelf. I think, to be honest, that Judaism one on one. There isn't some, something like that. That's the reason why I've never succeeded in reading the New Testament. I just don't have the context. So yeah. I start reading it, and I'm like, uh, "What is this?" And yeah. I, I can't read it. So, so a funny story about me about questioning. Yeah, uh, I, I was brought up uh, in the Orthodox Jewish world, uh, where in in a yeshiva environment where you're studying rabbinics, as you put it, um, one is encouraged to question. Uh, and and not only is encouraged to question, but if you're able to stump the rabbi, yeah. you're like the prize pupil of the class. Like if you can ask yeah. a question that the rabbi cannot answer, like on the spot, you're yeah. you're the guy. Like you're 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 the genius. And everybody's right. trying to do that. They're trying to stump the rabbi. And then um, I did my bachelor's through a yeshiva program, and then I went into a secular university for grad school. And I found out very quickly that professors do not share this uh, this. This, uh, <laughs> this view of wanting to be stumped in class, and it didn't take me very long to figure out that they did not appreciate the fact that I was trying to uh, ask questions and to contradict uh, what they were, what they yeah. were saying. So, 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 so in contrast I, I, to you, I actually studied Christian theology. I went to a Bible school, and let me tell you something. The Bible school I went to, first of all, is the reason why I'm, I'm where I'm at today because they were the ones that were my professors, at least were the bold ones that said, question everything. And, and I remember one, one professor, one guy, he was an amazing guy, amazing guy, uh, one of the smartest guys in the school, but he wasn't a slick talker like a lot of the other guys. And so, you know, he didn't get the limelight. But let me tell you something, when he would go on a rant in class, the guy was just, I mean, passionate, and and he 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 transmitted that passion for truth to his students that, listen, I have my opinion and you know, professor so-and-so has an opinion. And that's also what shocked me in Bible school is everybody had a different opinion about the end times, about you name it. And it was just like, so who do I pick? It's like, it's up to you. And I'm like, what do you mean up to you? You're supposed to tell me what the opinion is. What is this? And so that's what makes it very difficult for Christians. And, and this is something you need to understand. Okay. And this is for my Christian friends out there. And, and, you know, I'm not bashing. I'm telling you as guy who studied Christian theology, your pastors go through a system that really puts faith to death, puts death to faith. You know, it, it, because, because the way they, they, the way you study, and there, there's a reason why you call it cemetery and not seminary. You know, there's jokes like that for people who go to, to, you know, Bible school, they'll call it cemetery. And there's a reason for that. In Europe, for example, most of the guys who go and study in seminary, like I think it's 70% end up falling away from faith in general and become like secular or whatever. Uh, and, 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 and in evangelical circles, um, it's less because they more focus on relationship and, and personal relationship with God and all this stuff. So, so it sticks more, but still, when you get into the nitty gritty of theology, they don't like questions. They, they really don't. They don't like you to, cause it's like, it's, it's, it's the answer is, is option A, B, C, or D. And you get to pick one. That's it. Don't come up with an option, you know, J like, don't go there. That's yeah. what I mean. Whereas in Judaism, like you were pointing out, Joshua, it, it, you're there to stump and go, well, isn't there another option? Like, do we have to prescribe to one of these? Isn't there something else that maybe we've overlooked something? And that's the beauty of Judaism. In a, and I've seen in how Judaism has developed throughout 
the centuries is it's not that you're hung up on your traditions. You're questioning everything. And that's, I think, why Jews are so confident in their faith, for one, because especially if you've studied, um, you, you know, because because you're not afraid. You, you, it's not like you haven't questioned anything. It's not like you just take everything for granted. I have a friend who is an, who is an electrical engineer in Pittsburgh. Yeah. One of the top in his field in, in what he does. And he had a a, uh, a course that he took from Boeing, uh, the ones that make the Boeing engines for airplanes came in and mm -hmm. they taught a course. And he went to speak to this uh, master engineer who was giving the class afterwards. And he was uh, asking about whether, you know, this guy used to go around the world. He gave this course, you know, he used to travel for Boeing all around the world, teaching engineers around the world. And he said, well, have you ever been to Israel? And the guy started to chuckle. So he said, what do you mean? Like, what, what, why, are you, why are you chuckling? So he said, Israel was different. I've been all around the world. I've been to, to, to dozens and dozens of countries and I taught this yeah. course. And the only country, the, the, the country that's completely different than the rest was Israel. He said, what was the difference? Yeah. Where everyone went, the engineers would be sitting in class and they'd be taking notes and they'd be nodding and yes, yes. And they'd be you know, getting, gathering all the information. In mm -hmm. Israel, he says he barely got one sentence out and everybody started screaming, but why don't you do it like this? Why don't you do it like that? And it, it, like, it was a completely different experience for him because they, the, the Israelis just don't know how to just take it for granted take what's it, being yeah. said. They, they ask questions. So that's something not only for, it's not even religious Jews. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's ingrained in the Israeli culture. Thank so, you. That's a great point. That's a so, great point. And I think that's why it's hard when I mention some of these things, Christians feel like I'm getting on their case. I'm not. I'm really not. It's just that this is how we're born and brought up and bred. And that's and that's why I didn't fit in very well into Bible school in that sense. I didn't just take everything for granted. I questioned everything and I came back disappointed, to be honest. I came back disappointed because I thought, I didn't get my questions answered. You know, all I got was this is what we say. And this is what so and so says, and just fill out the test this way and have a good day. Like you know, and it's just like, all right, you know. So you know, moving on, you know, and 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 hopefully I'll get my questions answered one day. Um, and it's the same in the tour guide course, by the way. The tour guide course is the same. I'm like, I'm the guy who's actually trying to be the most quiet and not ask questions because I'm like, I think there's enough questions being asked throughout the course to where I want the guy to actually whoever's guiding us to get through the information. Um, Cause I realize, I mean, it's like if, if, if I pitch in as well and so and so like, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to, you know, <laughs> we have to so kind of stop. You, I'll give you the advice, Doron. Yeah. yeah. Was given to me by the, the former great uh, associate Supreme court's justice, Antonin Scalia. I uh, okay. was fortunate enough to study in his classes and uh, he was asked the question by law students, by, you know, first and second year law students, what yeah. they should do when their professors are teaching them X, but they know that the reality is Y. Meaning we understand as conservatives that this is the way that the law should be and the Constitution should be, um, right. should be interpreted. But the, our professors are teaching us differently. How should we answer on a test? You know, should we answer the, mm -hmm. the correct way or the way the professor wants? And he said straight ahead. He said, just write whatever the professor wants. Once you get your degree, then you can start to, to, to write and argue. But he says, just answer what. And, and I wish I had this advice when I went through grad school. It would have saved me a lot of pain. But uh, anyway, <laughs> we so much appreciate you coming on the air. It's been wonderful. There's so much to speak about. Elio, you want to close up? Yeah. Yeah. Um I just, uh, if, if there can be any message that comes out of this, I'm so excited to have Daron on. And I kind of know, I kind of knew that when we get together, there would be a lot to talk about. Sure. Um, one of the reasons why we're addressing this issue of the, the Temple Mount, the third temple, the first and second yeah. temple, is it's the heart of Judaism. Yes. And when, when you have people, even with the best of intentions, tell us, oh, that's not where the temple was. You're not talking about the temple. You're talking about my temple. It physically exactly. hurts me um, exactly. when when this is my faith. The Jews have finally returned to to Israel. We finally returned to Jerusalem. Um, we're being denied so much. Uh, this is such an important issue to Jews. This is this is our very heart to God fearing Jews. To God, <laughs> we want to wake up the other ones. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's our job too. And that's why it's so important for Christians to understand this. It's so important for Jews to understand this as well. 
Um, so 100%, their own, 100%. Yeah, this is this this is the heart of Judaism. And, always and I would like to even add, this is this is the only place on earth that God set apart for himself, where he said, this is my footstool, this is my throne, this is where I'm to be uh, uh, worshipped. And I think when we understand the holiness, the set-apartness of, of, of a location out of all the world, we can have anything. This is God's. And, and to touch what belongs to Hashem, that's where you start treading on holy ground. And I think that's where people need to be very careful in their opinions and recognize we're not talking about just a, a, a you know, where's the ark of, uh, where's uh, Noah's ark or where's the, you know, where's the holy grail, you know? No, we're talking about God's throne on earth. Absolutely. And it's holy. It's a holy matter that we all need to be very careful about. Absolutely. Thank you yeah. so much, Daron. You're doing amazing stuff. God willing, we'll connect again. Thank you, Josh. You're Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>